Good morning from uh, New York. Good afternoon to those of you in Europe and good evening uh, to those in Asia and elsewhere. If I've missed anyone out, apologize. Uh, welcome to this uh, briefing panel um, for the World Economic Forum. I'm Jerry Baker. I'm the editor at large of the Wall Street Journal. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you indeed to uh, the forum for hosting this in these unusual circumstances, but I know we're going to have a very good discussion. We've got a particularly interesting topic, um, which is on the issue of deglobalization. Um, obviously, it's be become a, a feature of the discussion of uh, global economics in the last year that the pandemic has had a significant effect and will have a significant long-term effect in terms of accelerating the trends and intensifying the trends towards deglobalization that have been that have been in place in the last few years the political and social backlash against globalization particularly in the developed world in uh, north america and in europe that we saw over the last few years to the uh, globalized the globalization of the previous 30 years um, does seem to be going in reverse in the last few years and it's been widely argued that the um, pandemic with its effect on global supply chains and its broader uh, impact on security in, uh, insecurity and uh, feelings of insecurity that people have um, is going to intensify those trends both at a business level and at a policy level and we're going to look at that uh, the this morning this afternoon uh, with three um, real experts uh, in their field uh, Beata Javorczyk, uh, who is the Chief Economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. She's uh, joining us today in Zurich. Um, uh, Richard Trumka, the President of the AFL-CIO, of course, uh, in the United States. He's joining us from Washington, the largest um, umbrella trade union organization in the United States. And Simon Evanett, who's the founder of the St. Garland um, uh, Endowment for Prosperity Through Trade, He's joining us from uh, St. Gallen uh, in Switzerland, too. So thank you very much indeed, all of you, for joining us. Looking forward to a lively discussion. Simon, let me start with you, uh, if I may, and, and, and pick up that question that I laid out in the, in the introduction, which is it, this belief, I think a lot of people have, um, that the pandemic is accelerating the trends towards deglobalization, towards the... The, the, the disintegration, if you like, of, of the global economy um, through its effect on global supply chains and perhaps more, more broadly through policy uh, and public, public sector responses. Um, how, uh, by the way, I, I was struck yesterday reading the World Economic Forum's uh, survey of chief economists. This was something that they actually think is a relatively small risk uh, over the next few years. They think they're a much larger risk. They, don't, they think the, the, the talk of deglobalization has been overdone. Uh, Simon, what's what's your view of this? Uh, I, I know it's a different because the pandemic has had differential impacts on different types of trade and different types of economic activity. Give us your sense of of what the long term structural impact of the pandemic will be uh, in this field. Thanks for thanks for this question. I would say that globalization in, in many respects is stored in key areas like in trading goods and in movements of fac uh, factories, of foreign direct investment. And we must contrast that with digitally delivered services, which I'll say a bit about in a minute. We have seen over the past 10 years, very weak uh, growth in trading goods. Uh, it has uh, stalled compared to the growth in the underlying world economy. Um, and we have seen even worse in the case of uh, foreign direct investment. So I think there is a, a case for saying that globalization is not becoming uh, not advancing in that area. I'm not sure you can go so far as to say it's reversing. And I think that's a, a key point, which might be what the chief economists were picking up on uh, in their in their assessment. Now, if you ask why is it stalling, at least in, on the good side, I think, uh, of course, we've had the trade war, which got a lot of attention, but it actually predates that because there have been a, it's been a surge in uncertainty about public policy towards cross-border business. And all the indicators we have of that show that essentially planning for cross-border trade and investment decisions has become so much harder. And not surprisingly, I think businesses are doing less of it. When you contrast that stalling with what we're seeing in cross-border delivery, delivery of services, in particular digitally delivered services, we are seeing an absolute boom. And what's interesting there is we don't have any global rules on that type of trade. And we, so we, and we can't put the growth down to liberalization at all. So this has happened organically and, and that part of globalization, I would contend, is alive and kicking and it's creating a lot of opportunities for people who are stuck at home, who want to be able to reach out to, to, to new employers and uh, who want to engage in uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity as well. 
Beato, if I may come to you, um, as Simon says, the impact uh, of this pandemic has maybe has been um, varied and, and maybe differential, perhaps particularly between uh, trade in goods where global supply chains have clearly been uh, disrupted and trade in services um, where, thanks largely to digital activity, there's probably been expansion. What's your, from, from your perspective, uh, the EBRD and your own perspective, what's, you, what, what, what's your sense about where these trends are going and, and what large, longer term and larger impact they'll have on uh, an integrated global economy? Thank you, Jerry. I think that claims of globalization being rolled back have been vastly exaggerated. I think that to a large extent, we have already exhausted the benefits of moving production to low wage location. So it would be unreasonable to expect that trade in goods would continue to grow at such a breakneck speed as we saw it in the 1990s. At the same time, I think that um, the pandemic is accelerating trade in services. But as Simon mentioned, it's a particular type of trade in services. Pandemic threw millions of workers into remote work. And now that many firms have discovered that this remote work setup works for them, um, they will think about you know, why limit ourselves to employees who are in our city or even in our country? Why not hire somebody abroad? You know, if you are sitting in London or in Paris, you know, why not hire somebody from Warsaw or Bucharest? Of course, there are limitations. You know, it helps if your employees are in the same time zone. It helps if they are subject to the same data protection regimes. It helps if they can um, travel to your premises without a visa. So from the EBRD's perspective, this is an opportunity for new EU member states, is an opportunity for Western Balkan countries and for the broadly defined EU neighborhood. Now, where we are going to see change in globalization is when it comes to geography of global value chains. I think we are going to see relocation, but because global FDI flows have been subdued 40% below the level in 2019, this change is going to happen slowly. Thanks, Beata. Richard, um, it seems to be generally true that um, the globalization of the larger, of the last of the 30 years or so from the 1980s onwards um, uh, left, while it obviously uh, lifted hundreds of millions of people in developing the developing world uh, out of poverty, it clearly um, uh, had uh, much more questionable uh, <laughs> effects and benefits and, uh, on, on workers in developed countries. And indeed, it's partly that political response to that, the response to that, and the response to stagnant wages um, to sharp declines in unionization, uh, obviously, which you represent, that there's been a kind of political backlash in the last few years. Tell us, if you would, whether, and now with the pandemic in the last year, um, seeming to elevate the importance of uh, domestic procure, domestic sourcing of uh, for, for manufacturing, for uh, more emphasis on supporting the domestic economy and the domestic workers and relying less on global supply chains. Tell us, if you would, how you see the, especially from your perspective at the AFL-CIO, how you see trade unions emerging from this and, 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 and how much more we can expect to see um, of, a, uh, of a reassertion of the importance of the domestic workforce. Well, first of all, in the United States, uh, labor unions are at their highest popularity ever. Uh, and MIT says that uh, 60 million workers would join a union tomorrow given the opportunity because of our antiquated labor laws, we can't give them that opportunity and we're gonna change those laws, but that's a different subject. You know, look, we, we've been talking about whether to globalize or de-globalize. And I think that's the, totally the wrong question we ought to be talking about. We ought to be talking about the rules of globalization because for the last 40 years, the rules of globalization have been written for corporate capital, international capital, and corporations to the detriment of workers, the environment, uh, and social stability around the world. So there have been big problems uh, with uh, globalization before COVID. Take the labor share of income. Uh, labor share of the top 35 advanced countries dropped from 54% to in 1980 to 50%. 
in 2011. In the U.S., it went from 63% in 2000 to 56.7% in 2016. All that COVID did was expose what this model is. And this model that we currently have in globalization is low wages, weak social protections, violations of workers' rights, and tax avoidance by many corporations. And so long as that is the model, there's going to be continued internal and domestic pressure in all the advanced countries to deglobalize. If we switch the model, and the model is based on democracy, based on decent work, based on a, a, sustain, a sustainable wage-led growth, and broadly shared prosperity, then the demand will be for more globalization. But until there's a realization that this system not only is unfair, but it doesn't work in the long run because it doesn't produce sustainable wage-led growth and only that will lead people out of poverty and keep globalization growing. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Beata, if I may come to you, the, um, as Richard says, this is, you know, the, again, the, the political reality um, has been driven in, in large part by uh, concerns, understandable concerns that workers in, developed in, in the developed countries have clearly not benefited um, anything like as much as either workers in developing, uh, in emerging markets or, or indeed the, 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 the owners of capital uh, in, in the developed world. Assuming, I think, as we all agree, there is going to be some long-term effect and a kind of political response to, you know, reassert the primacy of domestic of the domestic economies as a result, simply even even as at minimum as a result of the insecurity that people have felt in the last year. Um, there's going to be a you know we've seen inc huge increases in unemployment over the last year. We've seen tremendous economic suffering uh, in much of the world in the last year. What role do you think? What, how, how do you think policy will respond as as we begin to emerge from this pandemic? In the court, you know, we've seen a huge role in um, for fiscal policy, for fiscal support for for economies. How does that in, how does that transition? Do you think to the post pandemic world in the way in which um, economic policy is is conducted, and in particularly the role of the state and how big and how much more important the role of the state may become in these uh, in the, in the post pandemic economy? Well, over the last twenty years, we have seen an increased public support for the role of the state in the economy. Um, this increase has been present in advanced countries, in post-communist countries, where 45% of respondents say they would be in favor of greater role of the government in firms and in industry. And in emerging markets, it's over 50%. And if history is any guide, we are going to see even growing support for state involvement in the economy as a result of this pandemic. And this may mean that as firms, private firms struggle with their debts now, during the recovery phase, governments may rush to rescue them by injecting equity stakes, by actually doing outright nationalizations. And this may be quite problematic in emerging markets where rules governing state-owned enterprises are quite deficient. So for instance, in post-communist countries, in about half of those countries, um, there are no rules that would separate state ownership from regulation. And in fifth of countries, it's actually state-owned enterprises that are regulators in the sector. In most post-communist countries, there are no rules that would prevent state-owned enterprises from getting financial advantage uh, from their status. And there is a real danger that this will tilt the playing field against the private sector and make many emerging markets less attractive destinations for foreign direct investment. So this would be a force that would push towards deglobalization. Simon, to what extent are these pressures towards deglobalization organic, both organic in the sense of being driven by companies themselves, by the private sector in terms of global supply chain, concerned about the security of global supply chains, and how much are they 
policy driven by uh, some of the things that Beata has been talking about by issues like procurement, uh, you know, an emphasis on domestic uh, promoting domestic procurement. What's the what's the mix there? What's the what's what's the mix between policy and kind of organic private private sector response? I, w I would say most the mix is heavily on the policy side. The private sector is, uh, has had to think on many occasions about how to deal with disruption in supply chains. And they're, I think, pretty good at figuring out under, you know, how diversified you want to have your sourcing patterns to be, what the trade-offs are. And uh, this has, I think, come through very clearly in analysis of, of uh, private sector responses. What we're seeing, which I think is interesting on the policy side, is we have indeed public procurement measures like the Buy America measures, which were announced yesterday. Uh, we see more countries implementing those. Uh, we also see more countries putting lots of money on the table to firms to either expand domestic production or repatriate production. Japan has a multi-billion dollar fund to encourage firms to leave China and either go back home or to Southeast Asia. Germany announced in December uh, a scheme which would uh, incentivize the expansion of domestic medical production facility in Germany, so long as the goods were not, not too many goods were exported outside of the EU. And so we're seeing a lot of uh, money being put on the table by governments as well. I should add, just to build on what Piata Beata was saying, if we look back over the last 10 years, the response to the previous financial crisis was to see a sharp expansion, permanent expansion in the amount of subsidization in national economies. And it's not just a matter of China, it's not just a matter of state-owned enterprises. There's a lot of this going around at national and sub-national levels. So we've had a much more um, distorted <laughs> global economy for at least a decade. I mean, Richard, this all this sounds uh, like presumably like music to your ears, uh, you know, a bigger, a bigger role for the government, um, more emphasis on domestic uh, sourcing and the domestic workforce. Um, what's in some ways, you know, a not a complete reversal of the of some of the things we've seen over the last 30 years, but certainly um, both policy, both at the policy level and at the and, and at the uh, broader economic level, uh, a move towards uh, a move in a direction that will help presumably help domestic workers rather more than you've seen. You must, this, this, this is presumably welcome to you. Well, I, I think that's welcome to all workers. As I said to you earlier, uh, the, the current system has produced low wages, weak social protections and violations of worker rights and, and tax avoidance by many corporations. Uh, and, and that has put tremendous pressure on domestic governments uh, to do something. Also the, 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 the 2009 recession and the current pandemic have demonstrated that the market is not all knowing, it's not all fair, and it's not very smart sometimes. It will overindulge. And that's why government involvement is absolutely essential on, on both the inter, on domestic level and international level to make sure that corporations, for instance, can't go uh, shopping for lower taxes. So we would, we would support, for instance, uh, a corporate tax level of 20 to 25% globally so that everybody could would have to pay something. And that would do two things, uh, Jerry. That would one, it would prevent tax shopping uh, from corporations. Uh, and two, it would help uh, replenish revenue to, to governments that's needed right now, especially during the pandemic. One, to corral the pandemic, and then two, grow our way back out of the, uh, out of the hole that we've created in the economy after the pandemic's over. So government, Involvement is essential at two levels, the domestic level, but also at the multinational level. We have to create more multilateralism uh, on all of these fronts, whether it's confronting uh, tax avoidance, COVID, or anything else. And Richard, st staying with you, if I may, for a moment, your, your organization, your unions, are big supporters of Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden himself is, um, you know, has, has been, for a, a long career, has been seen very much as an ally of unions. Um, you've already heard, you know, Simon mentioned, just saw yesterday uh, his announcement of a Buy America uh, proposals, um, toughening the, the rules on Buy American for, um, for the fed for federal agencies, relative, obviously a tiny part of the US uh, economy overall, but nonetheless symbolically significant. Tell us what you think a Biden administration, and there is a kind of a view out there, obviously, that, that the Trump administration with its very aggressive, assertive America first uh, trade war against China, 
burgeoning trade war against the EU, um, you know, a very tough line on trade. There was a, there's a view that Biden, you know, Biden administration may take a different view. But but with all that you've said and with all that I've just laid out of Biden's background and what Biden stands for, tell us what you are expecting in terms of um, of, of, of the Biden administration's, what the Biden administration will do for U.S. workers and what what that will mean for uh, the globally integrated economy. Well, uh, first of all, there, there is a misperception about the, the Trump uh, administration, about how it was America first. It was America first, but it wasn't American workers first. Uh, under the administration, American workers really took it on the chin. He rolled back health and safety rules. He rolled back work, social protection. He attacked collective bargaining. So that was bad. Uh, and, and Joe Biden has a, a philosophy that he wants to build back better. And Jerry, the old economy that we had, if we just went back to it, really wasn't working for a lot of people. It had created three inequalities in this country. The inequality of wealth and wages, inequality of opportunity, particularly for people of color and women, but mainly the inequality of power for workers and employers. So until you fix the inequality of power between employees and employers, you'll never be able to fix inequality of wealth or inequality of opportunity. Joe Biden wants to do that. The first thing is to do is to change our antiquated labor laws. The labor laws that the US operates were, op were written 80 years ago. They've been amended a couple of times and each amendment was to take more rights away from workers. Now, workers in this country, the pandemic has really demonstrated to them how absolutely essential it is to have a voice on the job. M M MIT says 60 million would join a union today. We have a 65% approval rating. People need protection on the job and we're gonna give them that. Passing the PRO Act would do that. But Joe Biden also knows that that does something else. It's not just a labor law reform. That would actually be a stimulus bill because it would help wages rise for everybody, non-union people, which would create a consumer demand, which would lead to job creation. And two, it would be a civil rights uh, bill because it would help end the systemic racism if more people had unions and could get fair treatment on the job. So Joe Biden, we expect him to be the best labor union president that the country's seen since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That's a good note uh, on which I wanted to ask Beat, if I may. Um, uh, that sound, I mean, it, it, just as Richard has portrayed it there, it does sound, sound, it sounds a little bit like back to the future here. And I, I don't mean that in any way disparagingly, but but the the the, the, the we the, with a greater role for government, with the, perhaps the revival of uh, trade union membership, uh, the growth of trade unions, um, less trade, less global into economic integration. I mean, it sounds forgive me for, and I don't mean this again in any cynical way but someone who grew up in Britain in the 1960s and 70s um, it sounds sounds like sounds like back to that kind of world which of course was you know in many ways as Richard says a better world for unions and a better world for their workers um, but in terms of but it did lead to what was seen as slow growth and stagnation and low productivity and it was seen that the global integration that we saw over the last 30 years did actually help to improve um overall if you like global economic performance we can you know with, with that with question marks about the distribution of the benefits of that is, is is that a concern that you have that we may the world as 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 deglobalization does um continue that we are going to see an extended period of maybe of global economic stagnation well, I'm an optimist, um, but of course, how well we do depends on how successful we are with fighting the pandemic. Take the example of Eastern European countries. Um, last summer, they were praised for doing extremely well in managing the pandemic. Now they have mortality rates, uh, you know, among the top third, in the top third of, of the global figures. Um, so all bets are off. But, you know, pandemic creates opportunities for global cooperation. Richard mentioned here the need to cooperate on taxes. You know, after the pandemic, governments will emerge heavily indebted. They will be looking for new sources of revenue. And I think that their citizens will be willing to pay more if they perceive taxation as fair. And taxation will be perceived as fair if corporations 
pay what is due. And, you know, last October, October actually, uh, 2019, the OECD produced a proposal um, for an agreement um, on global taxation, allowing countries to tax corporations that have no physical presence in their countries. It produced a proposal for a global minimum tax. And I think the pandemic may cure those tax ailments by giving governments an incentive for greater cooperation on that front. Simon, you, you may want to comment uh, on, on some of the things you've heard and please do, but I, I also want to um, move you on in the time we have remaining to another very topical issue, which I think is, is, is kind of emphasizing these trends of um, uh, domestic policy, domestic, the interests of domestic uh, workers and, and the domestic uh, populations first, which is this tension we've seen over, vac over vaccines. Um, uh, we've seen within, the, within, within Europe real tensions over, um, you know, tensions between the UK and the, and the EU over the distribution of, of vaccines. Some countries are seem to be accelerating, seem to be very well, Britain in particular, um, in terms of promoting the vaccine, of, of rolling out the vaccine. Other, other countries in Europe, not so well. That seems to be creating tensions and it very much comes back to you know looking after your own populations first and there's also a larger impact of course you know it, it is very clear sadly for much of the, for the developing world that the these vaccines are going heavily to developed countries the countries that are advancing most rapidly so far the united states israel uh the uk some countries in europe other countries are going to lag very much behind what impact does all of that do you think have on um on on globalization and its and its and its and its opponents if you like I think the I think the opponents and the cynic, cynics of globalization are going to have a field day with, during this period of uh, vaccine rollout. Not only do we have the industrialized countries cornering the market, as one Indian diplomat put it to me recently, you know, buying up as much vaccine, and even amongst the industrialized countries, they're now fighting over who gets it. We have the EU about to impose an export authorization scheme, which is a fancy way of curbing exports, allowing their member states to curb exports. And this is already causing uh, massive tensions. You can expect that policy to be copied by other countries. And you can expect some developing countries to turn around and force compulsory licensing of the vaccine, hoping to manufacture it. I'm not sure they have the capabilities to do that, but they'll try. And then you can imagine that some countries which produce the ingredients for these vaccines are going to hold up the exports there. So we have, I think, a real potential here for a train wreck. Um, and uh, this will not uh, cover any of the global institutions involved in, uh, in, in any glory. And we, do, we desperately need here uh, some very sensible heads to be bashed together and to, to come up with some type of response which gets enough vaccines out to everyone. And of course, the deeper underlying problem is the scaling up of production for billions of vaccines, which clearly is going much more slowly than people had anticipated. We have just very short uh, amount of time left, so I want to get a very brief answer from each of you uh, finally to this question. Um, we've um, obviously talked a lot about globalization and its and it, and and the and the stalling or even the reversal of it over the last few years. Richard, if I can come to you first, um, and you've talked about how the United States uh, looks under Joe Biden to be going in a, you know, very much a pro-worker uh, direction, pro-worker direction. Is there, do you think, some some synthesis in which we can, um, which the, the, the World Economic Forum after, after, after all has been searching for this kind of holy grail for the last 10 or 15 years, which is where we can continue to gain the benefits of globalization and yet make sure that we are protecting the disadvantaged in countries. Is, is there a way, is, is, there, is, there, is there a middle way Way between the extremes of globalization and all the impact that that has had on American and European workers over the last 20, 30 years, um, and the kind of domestic America first, Europe, first, you know, isolationist domestic protectionist policies. Is there a kind, very briefly, is, the, is, is, there, is there a synthesis that can be achieved? Absolutely. Uh, that's what I said. Uh, we can come together and form a system of global rules that centers on democracy, that provides decent work, that provides sustainable wage-led growth and broad, broadly shared prosperity. That is the system, that's the formula for success. I have to challenge something you said earlier, Jerry. You said that we, because there was more union involvement, there was stagnation before in government involvement, there was stagnation. That's simply not true. That didn't occur until the global rules of, the rules of globalization took away wage growth and, and may, gave us low wages, weak social protections, uh, violations of worker rights and 
tax avoidance, that's when things started to, to go negative and stagnate. That can be reversed and all of us can win. The trade agreement we did with Mexico is designed to raise the standard of living for Mexican workers so that they can become consumers as well. It's absolutely essential. Uh, Beata, very quickly, is there a middle way or we, is the pendulum just going to swing back uh, towards deglobalization? I think there's a lot of scope for international cooperation, not just on vaccines and taxes, but also on climate change. So a lot of good can be achieved through uh, cooperation. Yep. Simon, very brief final word to you. Uh, yes, trade's been a human imperative for millennia. We have to figure this out. Terrific. Thank you all very much indeed.